Assalamu alaikum, everybody. My name is Salam al Mariadi, President of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Uh, we are having this important discussion uh, on the issue of morality or religious police that has uh, crept into our tradition as Muslims. Uh, but the Muslim Public Affairs Council has taken a stand against uh, the uh, concept uh, of Muslim of morality police and uh, is basically arguing uh, on the Quran and the Sunnah uh, or based on the Quran and the Sunnah that this is not part of Islam. And we have two scholars who will be discussing uh, the, the declaration, uh, what impact it can have. And some of the criticisms that we will uh, that we anticipate. So, uh, with me, uh, first, uh, we really thank uh, Mustafa Akiol, uh, who is a Turkish journalist and author. He has written two extremely important books: uh, one, "Islam Without Extremes: A Muslim Case for Liberty," and uh, I think more recently, a book that uh, a friend of ours, Jack Miles, who used to be with the LA Times. And uh, he recently wrote uh, God, a biography and God in the Quran. Um, he says that uh, this book uh, that, that Mustafa recently wrote, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom and Tolerance. Jack Miles says, Mustafa Akil has written a page turning intellectual adventure story that will rivet the attention of his fellow Muslims and raise the hopes of us non-Muslims all around the world. Uh, also with us, uh, I'd like to consider this one of our inaugural events with Dr. Javad T. Hashmi, uh, who has recently come on board as MPAC's uh, Director of Research and Strategic Communication. Uh, Dr. Hashmi is actually a medical doctor. He is an ER physician and has worked uh, for uh, decades, even though he looks very young. Uh, he has uh, w uh, decided, however, to change careers and has gone to back to Harvard uh, to get his PhD in Islamic studies uh, and uh, is, is really uh, a, a very important contributor to the work of MPAC and I believe to the work of American Muslims as they're dealing with issues of reform uh, and really what I consider to be important to every common Muslim, how Islam ap applies to us today um, and developing that understanding uh, of Islam's not only compatibility and relevance, but importance and vitality to American Muslim issues. Javad is actually the author of the Islamic Declaration uh, Against Religious Police. And uh, he and I have been talking about this for, for quite some time. And we were trying to get other Muslim organizations and religious leaders to sign on to this. And quite frankly, we could not. But we decided to launch the declaration uh, from MPAC and then let the world at least witness it. And then we go on from there. So I want to start with uh, Dr. Javad um, in explaining what is unique about this declaration. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Salam, for that introduction. I did want to say at the outset that I might be having some technical difficulties on the Twitter space. Uh, I didn't realize that my audio is going to my ear uh, earphones. So for anyone who's listening on Twitter, please join us on the YouTube channel. Uh, I apologize for that. So as far as what's uh, unique about this, uh, you know, I actually did some research and found that probably there's no Muslim organization that has put out a document like this. So I do think that it is historic, um, a clear and definitive statement against uh, religious police. So uh, many people will, many Muslims have acknowledged the issue of force and compulsion being a bad thing in the religion, but what are the specifics about it? And so I think this document is extremely clear that we're talking about force in any capacity, um, that religion is supposed to be something that's free. Now, there have been individual thinkers and uh, who have talked about this before, going back 100 you know, plus 200 years. Uh, Mustafa Akial is one of the most eloquent uh, uh, people who has talked about this. Um, and we're so honored to have him on. Thank you for coming, Mustafa. Um, but that's what I think is uh, unique about this document. Yeah, and, and uh, to, to Mustafa, 
Um, and would you, is it okay to call you Doctor? Yes, of course. No, 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 Mustafa. Nice. Mustafa. Okay, we'll go Mustafa and Javad then. Um, to to Mustafa, we, what this art, what this declaration is actually actually arguing against. It's not just the issue of re religious police. It's the issue of the ideology of compulsion. <coughs> where did you where did you find this ideology surfacing and and, and unfortunately dominating? religious tradition? Uh, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me in this really important discussion and congratulations to MPAC for taking a clear stance uh, on this issue, because there are a lot of issues in the Islamic world that we really have to face and deal with as people who value our religious tradition, right? I mean, as, as Muslims who have the faith in the core of our uh, religion, but there are a lot of ugly things happening in the name of Islam in different parts of the world. And, and we have to face these things. I mean, Christianity had to face even worse things, right? I mean, Christians were burning people at the stake and, you know, killing heretics. And But that changed by other Christians taking a stance against it. Uh, well, I mean, I, I love the docu doc document. I mean, I found a lot of familiar arguments, of course. I my, myself have spoken about these, written about these things. Uh, well, the reason why we have the problem is, though, for example, the document... Uh, Jamaat Jawad eloquently wrote, has a lot of verses from the Quran, right? I mean, that's the basis of our argument. Uh, one of them is the probably the most oft quoted verse when it comes to issues of freedom in Islam, la ikraha fi din, or there is no compulsion in religion, right? Baqarah 256. But uh, other Muslims are very careful to interpret this verse in a very limited way. I personally have seen this in Malaysia, where actually I gave a lecture on this issue of religious compulsion in 2017 in Kuala Lumpur. And I gave to a Muslim audience, I mean, the issue was apostasy, right? That's a part of the religious policing we're speaking about. And we don't want Muslims to lose their faith. I mean, that's not something we promote. But if somebody happens to lose his faith, is that a crime that has to be, you know, uh, that the authorities should go after. In other words, that, that does that require coercion? And I gave a 30-minute lecture saying, you know, there is no compulsion in religion. And yes, it's in the Islamic jurisprudence, but it was a different time. It was a political idea, actually, rebellion. It was all mixed. Today, we can certainly affirm uh, religious freedom. And I said, if people don't believe in Islam, you can't make them believers by forcing them, right? You can make them hypocrites. So religion is not something that you can police. The audience liked the uh, speech, but then while I was leaving the room and serious men walked into the room and they said, are you Mustafa Akil? I said, yes. They said, did you say religion cannot be policed? I said, yes. They said, good, we are the religion police. <laughs> so uh, actually I was arrested next day while I was leaving the country. I was put in a cell and you know taken to a court later. Uh, ultimately, they let me go thanks to some diplomacy, so it wasn't too bad. I appreciate that, you know, that part of the incident. But uh, this showed me that, you know, not everybody understands it this way. And that's actually why in the official translations of the Quran in Malaysia, they put a few words in parentheses. So there is no compulsion in religion, reads, there is no compulsion in entering the religion. Hmm. So they want to make sure that it only means that if you're not a Muslim, uh, if you're a Christian or a Jew, you will, that, and that's typically allowed, you know, in, in Islamic Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book, we will not force you to become a Muslim. So that part is appreciated in the tradition, and that's great. I mean, by the way, it was a wonderful thing thousand years ago that you, they're not converting to another religion forcibly. That was an amazingly tolerant, even a liberal, you know, stance. But once you enter Islam, things change in, in that interpretation. First, apostasy is a crime and you cannot, of course, do that. Second, you are subject to what we call today religious policing, right? Whether you're fasting, whether you're praying, whether you're properly dressed. These are all indeed fars in Islam, like, that is like compulsory, but does that compulsion come from your belief in God or does it come from an earthly authority, hispa forces, religious police forces? I mean, so, this problem is there in the, I think, uh, traditional interpretations. Uh, but I think it's not there in the Quran, as you said. I think the Sunnah, the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, doesn't also show uh, any religious policing. And I wrote a detailed article on that if people want to look what Hispa meant under the Prophet. Um, but it is there. And I think this has to be clearly uh, confronted. And I think 
one thing today we Muslims should see that not everything in our religious tradition is really a universal religious truth that we have to uphold. Because that religious tradition includes the core of Islam, the divine core of Islam, but historical interpretations that came from culture and the norms and the politics of a thousand years ago. And some many Muslims have already seen this in a few issues, like slavery was a part of our religious tradition. Luckily, it's history now. It has been abolished in Muslim-majority countries. Uh, and I think this issue of religious coercion is, 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 is the burning issue today, as we see in Iran and in some other countries. Uh, and, and we should challenge it because it, it, it's not correct. I mean, it's not right to force people to be pious is the way you define it. And it doesn't even help Islam. I mean, it, it just doesn't make people more pious. It makes people hypocritical or even sometimes people, it makes people loathe the faith, despise the faith. And, and actually it causes apostasy if, if, it's, if, it, if it is the thing that we really want to avoid. So I'm really glad that you wrote this document, Jawad, and, and MPAC published this. And I think it's an important statement. And it should be a conversation starter around Muslim communities in the West or in, in elsewhere. And, and <clears throat> yeah, on, on the issue of uh, uh, compulsion then, um, you decided to take a religious argument against it, not political, even though the issue of religious police at the end of the day, it's really political control uh, of, most of the time it's, it's political control of women uh, and, and, and half the population. Why, why did you decide to make it more religious than a political argument? Yeah, thanks so much. So I do think that religion and politics are often intertwined and inexorably so. Um, but uh, in this case, I wanted to make sure that we're making this a clearly religious document. So we even had a debate about whether or not to include political issues such as the sanctions against Iran, um, which I personally oppose and think that that pushes Iran in a more rightward direction and they have to, um, you know, they can't bend on these issues because it will look like weakness from their part. And uh, the reformist kind of, the reformist camp, um, you know, they're put in a bind when you have this kind of fierce pressure being put on them by the, by the West. Um, but I didn't really want to go into that much and we decided uh, to make this a clearly religious document because I do think that there is a religious ideology. Now, we don't think that that is the truly Islamic core, as Mustafa said. Um, and so I did want to uh, make sure that we address that because this is an issue not just in Iran. This is an issue across the Islamic world um, of religious police and religious force. So until we deal with that roots, this problem is going to crop up in every different country. And I just wanted to quickly piggyback off of what Mustafa said, that um, what we're saying is that there are different layers of our tradition. And if we go back historically, we're saying that early on in the very beginning, the prophet and the Quran came out strongly against religious compulsion. And then it was later on in the tradition, shortly after the prophet died, that slowly elements of force started being introduced. And the parallel is there with Christianity. So in Christianity, uh, there were early church fathers before Constantine. So there was uh, Tertullian and then Lactantius who said, something very similar to the Quran, that there should be no compulsion in religion. Um, and there's a really great article by Patricia Crona, the uh, historian of early Islam, who talks about this. Um, and then after Constantine converted, and shortly after him, uh, Theodosius I, that is when elements of force were being introduced. And it was a slow process, but it happened, well, it was a gradual process, but it was pretty quick. Um, that force was then introduced. So in the modern period, when Christians wanted to move away from religious force, they went back to the early period. As one Catholic uh, thinker put it, um, we went back to the deep past in order to correct the present. And I think that's a similar path for Muslims today, that we go to the deep past, which is the Prophet and the Quran, uh, which oppose religious force. And then the later tradition goes in the direction that Mustafa was talking about. Um, and I think that's very interesting how they interpret and I think interpret away these verses, they have different tools that they use. So the most common one is the catch-all abrogation. For those of people who don't know what abrogation is, it just means that the verse is canceled out. And they actually cancel out all of the, you know, more peaceful or tolerant verses and take like a handful of verses out of context and say that these trump the more peaceful or tolerant verses. Um, and then the other way that they will often uh, 
neutralize verses like this is what I call recasting. So they'll recast the verse and say, as Mustafa said, that this verse is only talking about religious compulsion when it comes to dhimmis or protected non-Muslim minorities, particularly Jews and Christians. Um, and so they restrict the verse in that way, even though the tradition acknowledged that uh, compulsion is being used, for example, against the apostate. And then the last point I wanted to say on that is uh, Michael Penn has written a book on, uh, he was talking about the Syriac sources in the first generation. And what he finds is that there were no uh, apostasy laws in that early period of Islam, uh, which is very interesting looking at the Syriac sources. So that was introduced at a later point in time. But I want to ask both of you to comment on the verse that these people use that Mustafa alluded to, the, the hispa, the you've been made to be the, the best community for humanity, for the nas, for people. Uh, that you will enjoin what is the doing of good and you will uh, repel or, or prevent uh, or oppose, uh, you know, uh, the bad, the, the, the evil, uh, and y that you believe in God. So that verse is what's you ha what has been referenced for religious police. How do you argue with people who believe that you have to enjoin people for uh, what they consider to be good, which to them are, are values or norms, and they 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 criticize the West that well the West has their norms, and uh, they say for example you cannot wear a hijab in France, uh, or you you can't dress a certain way, you can't be nude. So if they have their norms, why can't we have our norms and say this is what we are enjoining? Mm -hmm. Uh, can I? Sure. Yes. Yes. Please. I mean, thank you. These are questions I love and, you know, the issues I, I, I speak about and write about. And uh, I mean, on this very, of course, important two things you mentioned. One is the Quranic commandment of Imre bil Maruf and Nehir al Munkar. I mean, like commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, which is being taken as the basis of religious policy. Well, I have a whole chapter on that in my book, Reopening Muslim Minds. Recently, I also wrote a somewhat inspired by the book, but more detailed uh, ar uh, article for New Lines magazine. People want to, if they want to see, they can look into that. And there I show that actually this idea of em commanding the right and forbidding the wrong wasn't initially understood as religious policing as it is done today. Uh, the earliest commentators of the Quran, like Muqatil ibn Sulaiman, for example, the earliest tafsir, the exegesis that we know, when you look into him, he says it, it, it is, it's about proclaiming Islam and forbidding polytheism and idol worship. So very basics. It's not about like whether you're really uh, praying, whether you're fasting and whether you're like covering your head. So that that appeared later. Uh, I mean, a scholar who really studied this book is, um, is it Michael Cook. I think he has this full book, like Commanding the Right and Forbidding Wrong in Islam, like 700 page book. And I read all of it by, you know, looking into the sources. There he shows that that was not the only way to interpret is this. And today, no wonder, I mean, Muslims understand this also like as Dawa giving the call to Islam, right? Which is totally fine. I mean, that's a part of religious freedom. You can call people to Islam. You can also, uh, by example, by preaching, you can promote Islamic ideas. Whether you use coercion or not, that's a choice. And I think that's not grounded in the Quranic text itself. And, and it appeared over time. And that also is seen in the evolution of the whole idea of hispa. You know, these forces are called hispa, uh, at, or they're called muhtasib, the one that who does hispa. And that's an, of course, Arabic term, which means accountability. And people say, oh, hispa was established by Prophet Muhammad. So this is sunnah. Well, when you look carefully into what Prophet Muhammad did with hispa, you see that it was about preventing fraud in the marketplace. It's a very important thing in the Quran. The Quran condemns all those people who are fraudulent in their uh, practices and trade. Uh, Mecca, Mecca, both Mecca and Medina are like places with marketplaces. So preventing fraud, which is a universal value, right? It's not a specific religious thing. Everybody does that. I mean, uh, fraudulent practices, cheating on people, you know, stealing people. I think he, which connects me to the second point you asked. You said, I mean, people say, oh, every country has laws. So what, what's the difference? Yeah, every country has laws, but there is a difference between North Korea and Norway in the content of their laws, right? I mean, 
China has laws about Uyghurs and we condemn those as genocidal, right? I mean, such a persecution. So the mere fact that there's a law is not, not doesn't make everything universal. The content of those laws is important. And I believe in having laws that are based on universal values that everybody can agree on, like theft and murder should be banned in every society, right? And people's rights and security should be protected. That is regardless of whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew or an atheist. These are established through universal agreements. The concept of natural law, you know, refers to that. And, and that is very, pretty well established. And I mean, Muslims living in America can agree that, well, there are laws banning theft or murder, which is good for all of us, but you can be a Sunni or Shia or a Christian or an atheist or Jew or Christian, I mean, whatever you, your worldview is, and you can live under those. But you pointed to another thing, which is important. Some laws in the West are also coercive. And I've been coercive in an illegitimate sense. And I've been very vocal about criticizing those. I mean, these, for example, the, the laws in France, as you mentioned. And in France, in Austria, uh, in, in a few European countries, there are laws that limit hijab or ban niqab, you know, the face whale. Uh, we don't have that everywhere. You don't have that in the United States. You don't have that in the UK or Canada, with the exception of Quebec, because the Anglo-Saxon legal political culture is more classically liberal, more you know respectful of religious freedom. And I, I think that's the correct one. Now, what is interesting is that sometimes I criticize religious police in Iran, and I sometimes see Muslims defending Iran coming and saying, but what about France? They banned the hijab there. And I'm asking you, okay, are you in favor of France doing that? Like, I'm actually against both, right? I mean, against any coercion so people can live in their values. Of course, some, some values are universal. Like you said, nudity. It's not allowed anywhere in the world. And actually, by looking at the Quran's Adam and Eve story, you can understand that it's, there's something in human nature that finds it wrong, even without any revelation. I mean, you know, they, they were ashamed and they were covering themselves when they realized, I mean, that's in the Adam and Eve story. So you can say some values, natural law tradition refers to that. Intuitively, many societies limit certain things, but it is not as imposing hijab. And that's why you don't have riots or, you know, demonstrations in the West, why don't you allow us to be nudists? I mean, right, I mean, that's a marginal thing. But there are many people intuitively understand, yes, there are some basic norms of common life, but you don't force people, your specific, you know, religious uh, injunctions. And what is interesting is that when we're speaking of religious coercion in Islam, ultimately it turns into sectarian coercion because somebody defines that religious also through for example, in Malaysia, I know that Shiites have been very much oppressed. I mean, they can't have their religious gatherings because they're seen as a heretical sect. So what is even imposed is not Islam per se, but a specific interpretation of Sunni Islam. That is the same in Iran, the other way around. I mean, Sunnis in Iran have a lot of problems with the limitations they, is, they face from the uh, Shiite you know, uh, regime. So I believe accepting certain universal norms of religious freedom uh, and not coercing, uh, not using coercion uh, with, with, with uh, religious issues, I think is the way to go. And some Muslims think that when you do that, everybody will become secular and we will lose the faith. And I think that reveals uh, distrust in our own, own faith. I mean, our faith is not based on the fact that we force some people to, to believe in it or practice it. Muslims already do these things uh, by their own faith and conviction, and that's the right way to go. So uh, if I could piggyback off of what Mustafa said, um, and I agree with everything that he said, basically, but um, I think if we look at the Quran itself, uh, when it comes to enjoining right and forbidding wrong, the verse says, so, I mean, there are multiple verses, but look at the one that we quoted in the declaration. This is uh, Surah 3, uh, verse 104. Let there arise amongst you a community inviting to the good enjoining right and forbidding wrong, it is they who shall prosper. So it's an invitation. And elsewhere in the Quran, it's even more explicit, where it says, invite to God's way with wisdom and beautiful preaching and engage in discourse with them in the most gracious manner. So this is in Surah 16, verses 125 to 127. Consistently throughout the Quran, we see that it's saying that your job is to preach and call, and this is to the prophet. So if it's to the prophet, how much more does that apply to us 
that uh, we cannot use force, that we are not dictators over the people, we are not warders over the people. So I think the Quran itself is clear that our job when it comes to enjoining the good and forbidding the wrong is to use our tongues and inviting people. Uh, what's interesting is there is this kind of similarity between the argument that the Quran, and I'm not the first person to say this, Mustafa has said this, and uh, other scholars have said this, that it's very uh, interesting that the Quran sounds like John Locke, or actually John Locke sounds like the Quran. Uh, John Locke says that uh, if anyone uh, is to force people to the religion, then why didn't God himself do that? And the Quran made this argument, you know, thousand years plus before uh, John Locke. So I think that's interesting. The other thing is, I think the way that uh, conservative traditionalists uh, will defend this idea of using force, uh, and then they'll, they'll talk about the example that Mustafa gives about France versus Iran, they'll say there's no uh, similarity. Why? And this goes back to uh, how the Catholic Church used to justify this, which was they had a doctrine, error has no rights. And so they would say, well, we are on the huck, we are on the truth, and you're on falsehood. So there's no similarity between the two. We can force our way. Uh, and religious freedom is only in regards to what is right and true, and we can block it for everyone else. So that was kind of the argument that's been used. And I think that is the real argument that conservative traditionalists and fundamentalists uh, would use. I would simply say that we should look at what the Quran says about this and how the prophet uh, engaged. And what we see is that there was reciprocity in the Quran and in the Prophet's conduct. So for example, the Quran says, to me, my religion, and to you, your religion. So there is this uh, reciprocity that is um, exhibited uh, that the Quran is um, kind of putting forward. And similarly, when it comes to the constitution of Medina, we see that there's this reciprocity between the Prophet and the Jews that are in agreement with uh, the Prophet and the believers. Um, so I think the argument uh, in the Quran is going toward this bilateral reciprocity that we should um, look into and say that the Quran is all about fairness and justice. And so I think that's what we should um, focus on. And, and then the last point I would say is, as far as the example of, yeah, well, we all have laws when it comes to nudity and, and this kind of thing. I think the, the, the reasonable way to respond to this is about reasonableness that there is a difference, as Mustafa said, between North Korea on the one hand and America on the other. Everyone has norms, but it's about reaching that kind of reasonable grounds. And I, I, I think that we all know that there is distinctly religious stress and then just a common kind of decency that may in some ways be related to historical religious norms and stuff. That's fine. But um, there is clearly a difference. Um, so... Uh, that's where I would go with there that. There was a, a comment that came in, you know, why don't we submit this declaration to the Organization of Islamic Conference, the OIC? Uh, and another question, you know, w w w will this have any impact on Iran? I mean, will the Iranian government listen to anyone <clears throat> yeah. that stands against religious police? If, if I could answer the second one, because uh, since we issued the declaration, I guess one of the easiest things to say is, do you think Iran is really going to listen to this? No. Okay. So in some sense, this is, of course, performative. But the point is that we're putting this out there, um, trying to change the discourse. And I do think that a document can take on a life. It takes time. So I think this is the first step. Uh, the first step is actually individual thinkers saying things. And Mustafa has done a great job of that. And now this is an organization that's putting its weight behind it. And um, so I think it's important from that standpoint that we put this out there. Um, so no, I don't think I Iranian leaders will actually r listen. I don't even know if they'll read the document, but the point is that we uh, put this out there. And eventually, you know, decades from now, the, you know, history books will see, okay, this was a document and uh, people build on it. We also Mustafa. had a couple of other comments and questions come in. So let, yeah, let, let Mustafa respond, uh, add to this, and then, and then we'll go yeah, to the other sure. Quickly, I mean, uh, Joe, I agree with everything Jawad said. Uh, I mean, there has been Shiite scholars, actually, who have been critical of real discourse. One of them is Mohsen Kadivar. I know him personally, and his work is really important. He's written about blasphemy and apostasy laws. And, and I know in, even in Iran, there are clerics who are realizing that this whole coercion thing is backfiring and making Iranian society not more religious, but quite less. And some of them have silently said these things. But in a regime built on the you know, claim of top-down Islamizing the society will not uh, change its views. 
and particularly because you know yes some of the western sanctions those things i'm against those things as well so they don't help and when you corner a regime it doesn't become more moderate it generally becomes less and so we see that dynamic as well but this is wrong to it is wrong to understand this as a western imposition on muslim societies uh, the west might be speaking about these things because of universal values sometimes out of you know cynical geostrategic issues but we muslims for ourselves need to you know appreciate more freedom so that we don't oppress each other in the name of religion right we don't we don't persecute the other sect we don't we don't persecute other muslims with, with different worldviews and and it, it's for our own good and one thing that i think jawad referred to john Locke. i mean i read Locke maybe 15 years ago and i said oh my god he's speaking about our issues <laughs> because these were the christian issues b- back at the time but john Locke made arguments f- not from another tradition but from the bible he said no no there is no christian commonwealth in the bible show me that it so there's no idea of divine right uh, divine rights of kings but, that some people were believing in it and that is that's only an analogy to the discussion we need and we are actually having today from our own religious tradition we have to look back to the found foundational foundations that we will we believe in and you know we're, we're based on those but to have some criticism to the current problems that are also in the tradition itself as well and i just uh if i could add something there um, mm-hmm. I don't. E- so sometimes we get asked this question, and I'm sure it's in the chat. I'm kind of seeing it. Is that are we just kind of mimicking secular liberal values and imposing them onto Islam? Um, I would say uh, two things. Number one is I would say the history of when it comes to the history of thought, the idea of religious freedom precedes secular liberal- liberalism, as uh, Patricia Crona has noted. And there's also some very good books on this topic written about the history of religious freedom. Like I said, it started with early church fathers. Um, so, uh, and then the Quran picks it up. And so it's from the beginning of our religion, um, I would say. The second point is that you don't necessarily need to embrace classical liberalism. So I don't consider myself a classical liberal. Um, I My arguments are grounded in the Quran. I'm, I'm very Quran centric. And I think it's just against our religion to force it upon other people. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm kind of uh, moving in a what's called a post-liberal direction. But I think that um, India is a good example. India has what's called principled distance. So you can actually have a government that supports religion, but it has to be in a neutral way in the sense of not favoring one religion or one religious sect over another. Um, and I think this is important to give this uh, option uh, to Muslims because I do think there's a fear that religion has declined considerably in the secular West. And there's a fear that this will happen in the Islamic world as well. Um, so I think one option is this kind of principal distance model that unfortunately is not being followed in India anymore because of the right wing Hindutva. Um, but I think that's another option as well. Rebecca Hosseini, our chief of staff for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Uh, you have uh, some questions or comments from our audience. Yeah, absolutely. There are a few that have come in, but um, you guys have touched on some of it, but I'll read through them just in case you want to address them directly. Um, First one is, isn't the difficulty with Mustafa's argument that universal values are difficult to define? Yes, murder and theft are easy, but ideas of human rights are not always, for example, LGBTQ, migrant rights, etc. And someone referenced that saying to look at the work of Professor Abdullahi Anayim. Um, who addresses this question, but do, do you have any direct comments to that question in particular? If not, I can move on to the next. Um, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, I mean, universal values, because it involves the contributions of different societies and nations and civilizations and all that, it's not easy. But that doesn't mean that universal values have not actually gained some broad recognition. I mean, universal Declaration of Human Rights is universal because a lot of countries, most countries sign up for it. Uh, even Muslim-majority countries, with some reservations on apostasy, I know, that, like, for example, Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, here is the question is this. Yes, these are discussed in how exactly LGBT rights should be, you know, applied. That's an endless discussion. And I myself don't agree with everything I hear from some of the circles that are called woke or, you know, progressive in the left. I, because I think people may may have their conservative values 
while respecting the rights of other citizens not to live by those values, but they can preserve those values. Sometimes some human rights narratives turn into you have to accept and cherish our way of life. But people don't have to do that. You just have to accept that other people have their way of life and, and they can live by that. And you can you know disagree with that, even disapprove that that's also your right. So there are, yes, there are endless discussions, but ultimately abolition of slavery. I mean, let's take that. I mean, that's been a universal contribution and it happened with the arguments of universal human rights. And some Muslims resisted that, unfortunately. I mean, the last countries on earth to uh, abolish slavery were Saudi Arabia in 1961, I think. And in uh, Mauritania, actually the last country was in 1982. And the people who resisted abolishing slavery said that, you know, it's in the Sharia, you know, that, that. but today uh, we don't, most of us don't see it that way. Even, even most conservatives say that, well, slavery was not a design of Islam. It wasn't a part of Islam, just Islam founded in its own historical context and actually mitigated and actually abolishing it was the long run goal. And finally it happened. Now, if you can make the argument there, why cannot we make on uh, on other issues? Now, the, the point here is not signing up to something that somebody says out there, right? Okay, some, some Western power or country or civilization or UN says this, and we just have to blindly follow that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that we should honestly think about religious coercion. Does it come from our religion? Does it help our religion? Uh, and when you have that conversation, you will see, you see yourself, oh, my God, yes, a man named John Locke said something similar. It doesn't mean that you would agree with John Locke or the classical liberal tradition on everything. But the classical liberal tradition in the West is interesting because it was, it, it was a struggle with the same issue in Christianity, and which was actually a more severe problem in Christianity because we always allowed Christians and Jews to preserve their religion. Christianity didn't even allow that for a very long time, that forced conversions of Jews and Christians came. So this is not about signing up to something without considering it, but having a conversation. And I think the key issue here for us Muslims is to be able to distinguish between religious commandments and public laws. Like fasting in Ramadan is a religious commandment, but is it a public law that we will monitor if people are fasting or not, which they do in, in some of these societies. And because when you do that, you begin to lose the very essence of religion, which is worshiping God with your own sincere will to worship God. I mean, are you going to the mosque because you fear God or because you fear the police? You should go there because you fear God or you love God, you want to worship God. So I think that was a blind spot that was lost uh, in, in, in our religious tradition. Although some scholars actually highlighted that uh, as I as I explained in the in the recent New Lines magazine, I said especially Sufis realize that when you go with this religious course of idea, you end up with hypocrisy and 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 this idea of uh, religious police should be that's why I questioned. If I could uh, answer as well about this idea of universal moral values, I think there are three positions one can take uh, almost on a philosophical level. Um, two of them I feel are on the extreme side. On the one hand, you have the idea, um, it's kind of a postmodernist idea that there's no such thing as universal moral values. They're all cultural relativistic. Um, interestingly enough, this position is held by the Islamic tradition, uh, certain parts of the Islamic tradition. Uh, if you read Ghazali, actually part of him, it sounds like he's a postmodernist. And, and that's why I think there's this strange alliance between kind of the fundamentalist strain and this postmodernism, which they take up and they, that brings them some intellectualism. That's the idea that there is no universal moral values and that we bring everything to bear from our own backgrounds. Um, and, and, that's, and then we call it universal moral values. And this is a very common view now in the Western Academy. Um, the second uh, view is what I would call the naive. So that's the non-realist view in the sense that universal moral values don't exist. They're non-real. And then they're just kind of posited a social construction. And then on the other hand, you have uh, what I would call the naive realist view, which is that universal moral values simply exist out there and we're calling to them. Um, but I think there's a, uh, and that's criticized by uh, people in the academy. Um, then there's what I would call critical realism. And that's the view that I embrace, which is the idea that Yes, there are universal moral values. There's some common core morality out there. We may not agree what that is, but clearly there is some common core morality out there. Um, and yes, our backgrounds will affect 
how we interpret those values or bring them out, which ones we identify. But there is something uh, out there that we could call this common core. And I think that's a deeply religious idea. I don't think you can justify that on pure secular atheism. It's very hard to do that because we're just evolutionary byproducts. But I think it's a religious value and it's in the Quran itself. Enjoining right and forbidding wrong presumes that these are well-known uh, values um, that are shared. Um, and so that's what I think uh, we would answer to that is that, yes, there is some common core morality and that's kind of hardwired into the fitra of the human being by God himself. Um, and we might disagree what that entails, but clearly we should at least agree that there is some core morality and then we build around that. And I think that's really the debate for me at least. Rebecca, go ahead. All right, we have another uh, question here. How do we push back against the more accurate bros who basically bully out your more nuanced takes in the Dawah scene like Muhammad Hijab and Daniel Hakikat, especially? <laughs> they did, sorry, that I could not pronounce that. They did dismiss your it's voice. Pikachu. Okay, no, thank I'm you. No, no, I'm kidding. I'll it's happy it. you. <laughs> <laughs> they dismiss your voices. There's so much slander and mockery against your takes, and they dismiss you as liberal Muslims, etc. But they are popular, and your voices are so important. Um, who wants to take that one first? I, I think I'll take it first, since uh, Mustafa is is too uh, saintly to mm -hmm. engage with these uh, trolls. Uh, I'm the one who street fights them. Um, I'm not as uh, uh, Mustafa Akiol is just, is just the most courteous gentleman. I think he, someone had dubbed him, I think it was Shadi Hamid who dubbed him the most courteous man on the internet. Uh, I don't have that honor. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think, first of all, we should acknowledge that Daniel Hakikachu, Muhammad Hijab, and these fellows, um, they are the Ahk right, and they do not represent kind of the mainstream of Islam, and we shouldn't portray it as such. In fact, one of the comments that I was uh, received, one of the critical comments was that, oh, okay, you people try to portray them as mainstream in order to critique a straw man. And I, I don't think that's what we're doing at all. Um, but unfortunately, they are popular amongst a younger segment of, I think, angry Muslim men. Uh, and that's what the kind of Jordan Peterson phenomenon and really the Andrew Tate phenomenon is. And I, I don't I don't think and, uh, Jordan Peterson is all bad or anything like that. But I'm just saying there's this kind of angry young elements that we're trying to combat against. Um, but as far as the actual question itself is, all that I think we can do is present our arguments and I think that's the fear that they have is that when we present our arguments, a lot of people, even in their audience, is going to say, a small percentage of them, hey, that's kind of reasonable. That's not outlandish. And so the only thing that we can do is put our uh, voice out there and our opinion out there. And I think that's what we're doing. Well, Richard Nixon had a term, uh, the silent majority. He came up with that term because there were radicals, the vocal radicals or the radical uh, vocals, whatever. But any in any case... Is that what we're dealing with today, Mustafa, that we're speaking for the silent majority? Or, or is that extreme point of view really the predominant majority view right now? Well, since the majority is silent, we can't exactly know what they're thinking. But I think there's a spectrum of views. I mean, on the question uh, of, I mean, the, the folks you mentioned, I mean, I don't engage if someone is aggressive or say thank you have a great day and they, they do tech fear and you know all that kind of stuff and uh demonize you and but i'll say a few things so i mean i'm trying to look into their mindset and one thing is this uh they the people you mentioned here and especially the one that really does the tech fear take fear kind of language the, what they do is oh show people like me as or jawad or you know uh, mpac at this point right i mean Oh, you are kind of imitating the West. You're just following the West. Like you, you left your your compass is the West. That's what they're saying. Whereas to me, actually, the West is their compass in just the reverse way. They just believing, condemning everything that the modern world is out there. Um, democracy, that's kufur. Liberalism, that's kufur. I mean, if the West says something, we will reject it precisely because the West is saying that. By the way, which West? I mean, there are all different kinds of ideas in, in, the, in the West as well today, especially. So I believe in thinking of our issues as an ummah, as a, Islam, as a community of Muslims, by being open-minded and sometimes getting some ideas from the West or the East, or I don't know, maybe some good ideas in India, certainly pre-Modi India. I mean, Jawad mentioned those. Uh, or other civilizations. And 
And I think that was the very secret of our golden age that we Muslims generally long for. I mean, Muslims studied Plato and Aristotle. They didn't say these are kafirs who don't who don't deserve anything. No, they studied, they translated it, they commented on them. And that openness was actually the very secret of our great Islamic golden age, I mean, a thousand years ago. So I do believe in learning from every tradition out there and by our own tradition, of course, and engaging with these issues. And those people kind of bring this kind of energy like we are rejecting everything and we are defending everything out there in our religion. They go all the way to defending slavery, concubinage and all that. And I think a lot of Muslims, when they think, you know, with a clear conscience, see that this is no way to go. And one more thing, what is funny about those people is that they condemn Western liberal society all the time, right? Where do they live? I mean, I look at them. Well, they live in London. They live in Texas. They, I mean, why don't you move to Afghanistan and live there if that's really heaven on earth? I mean, under the Taliban. It's very interesting that they are actually enjoying the freedom, free speech of Western liberal societies and saying that this is the worst thing that has ever happened to us. And uh, I come from not the West. I mean, I didn't grow up in, 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 in I come from Turkey which actually has its own peculiar history. You know, it actually had a very illiberal secularism, French style, even worse than France. It banned the hijab. So much of my early intellectual career, I combated against hijab bans in Turkey, right? But then I looked at Iran and I said, well, I can't defend the hijab in position there. So there should be an idea of principle uh, that of individual freedom. That was my way actually to philosophical reasoning towards what we call liberalism in the broad tradition. And I do call myself a Muslim liberal, and I'm not ashamed of that. I mean, Nama Kemal, the great Ottoman constitutionalist in the 19th century, would call himself as liberal. Liberalism, hurriya, it's, it's an Islamic value. Uh, Hayreddin al-Tunusi, the great Tunisian uh, scholar from the 19th century, he also said, you know, hurriya, freedom, is a value. Actually, it's in our sharia, but we lost it, but it, you know, progress in the West and so on and so forth. So, the term liberal, I mean, democracy was kufr. I, I'm old enough to remember that. I mean, in, in the eight, in the 80s or 90s, I mean, because there's a will of God, a will of the people, of course, you should choose the will of God. So democracy takes you to kufr. So that argument has been toned down a little bit. A lot of people now understand, well, democracy is not a bad idea for Muslims. I think the same thing is for idea of religious freedom or liberalism, you know, in the broad sense of the word, which doesn't mean that I agree with everybody who called themselves liberal or and everything that, that that comes out there in liberal societies. And um, I would also point out, and we could go on forever, Mustafa, this is a great conversation. Um, I would say that liberal Islam or liberal theology is not synonymous with liberalism as a philosophy. They are distinct. There is some overlap, uh, but one can be a liberal theologian and not necessarily be an advocate of philosophical liberalism. People use these terms, unfortunately, very loosely, and this causes a lot of confusion, including with the word like secular and secularism, and we know this. So the problem is that people don't clarify their terms or are not clear in their own thinking. The other thing I would say is uh, to uh, uh, echo what Mustafa was saying, not only do these people live in the West, Texas, um, but they also are products of the West, distinctly products of the West. That's, this is why recently, quite embarrassingly, uh, Andrew Tate, converted to Islam, and he didn't need to make any changes in his lifestyle, really, substantively, uh, and his messaging. And uh, he fit right in now with the ah right bros, because they are advocates. So they, they will be very critical of feminism, and yet they are actually advocates of men's rights movement, which is also the flip side of feminism. Uh, and it's a Western, modern uh, ideology, and some of them call themselves men's rights activists. So I think we should point the finger back at them as well, that uh, they too are a product. We all are products of our backgrounds and environments. That's unavoidable, is what I, I would say. Back, yeah, I want to go back to a point that um, Mustafa was brought up, and that's the issue of Islamic political movements tend to be reactionary to anything that is Western. So if, if, if the West calls for democracy, well... We, we're against democracy. If the West calls for human rights, well, this is another invention of Western secular liberalism. So we, we cannot have, we, we will have our own definition uh, of human rights. Um, however, 
the United States policy on certain issues tends to uh, harm the people that they are trying to protect, whether it's religious minorities uh, uh, or minority communities, whatever. Whenever the United States goes in and says, we need to protect A, well, that, that, that group A becomes target number one by the extremists. So what would be your advice for U.S. policymakers on navigating the course on these important social issues, but the United States government tends to harm the people they, they try to protect? Well, I mean, I would say, first of all, uh, do not wage any more wars and, and drone attacks and bombings and stop these so-called endless wars. I mean, destruction of, I mean, the invasion of Iraq was a terrible mistake. The maybe initial, you know, Afghan war on Al Qaeda maybe had some justification, but this, this twenty-year-long occupation there didn't help anything, and it just brought the Taliban back. And all this war on terror concept again, there was a legitimacy on and a response to Al Qaeda, but but the human rights violations that came with it and and the disruptions of the internet. I mean, st leave that aside and don't do that anymore, right? And even face those evils. I mean, all the Abu Ghraibs and terrible things that we have also seen. And I, I mean, I, I criticize, I mean, I believe in some values that are in the West, but I'm very critical of Western foreign policy when it turns into a interventionist, you know, uh, and also Machiavellian, you know, power politics. Second, stop di supporting dictators in the Muslim world, thinking they bring stability and, you know, oil or whatever interest that you have. That is a part of the problems because one of if one of our problems is religious coercion, the other one is just autocracy, right? Sometimes secular autocrats or Arab world is full of these autocracies. So there are a lot of things that we should criticize in Western foreign policy. But two things should be different. Uh, we, we ourselves should be able to distinguish that foreign policy, all these things from the values that have been established in Western democracies which Muslims enjoy. I mean, Muslims can be very critical of American foreign policy, but many American Muslims are happy to live in America and they appreciate religious freedom or freedom of speech. I've seen that in the in the U, U, US, UK as well. Uh, second, we should understand that the, the history of the world is not this endless war between Islam and the West, right? I mean, it's a geostrategic jungle. I mean, Muslims suffered a lot from Russia too. I mean, I, I come, I myself come from a Circassian family that was destroyed. I mean, North Caucasus was destroyed and occupied by Russians in the 19th century. Muslims in the Balkans are, you know, they're more worried about the Russian imperialism and their influence. Now we see China leading a genocide against Muslims. So instead of obsessing about the West, we Muslims should try to protect the Muslims, rights of Muslims and minorities and Muslim societies everywhere. And that sometimes can, we can agree with some Western policies and ideas. We can, we can, we can criticize them when they're, when they're aggressive. Ultimately, this reactionary attitude is not helping us. And I think we should be more self-confident about who we are and our place in the world. And we should have an honest conversation. Then actually we can even help contribute to the West too. Uh, some of its its internal conversations that are going on, if we are not just reactionary and hating it, and rather you know contributing something to it. Uh, I would add that I think we should um, also eschew the idea that America, its foreign policy, they're just a bumbling idiots who don't know what they're doing and they just get it wrong, and th this causes a, a back lash or uh, a reverse reaction. I think the reality is, is that there is not a clear intent. There's this misconception uh, that America wants to push this kind of liberal Islam on to the Islamic world. Really, the truth is that historically, if you look at the record, the idea is to support whoever is useful for a geostrategic interest. And often that has actually been the right wing Islamist governments. Um, Wahhabism was supported by them. For absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. By the British and then by America. So uh, we need to actually, again, point the finger back. And I think that's important because often it's claimed that these liberal Muslims are the ones who are kind of Rand Muslims and agents. Well, there are all sorts of uh, reports that have come out where they're talking about supporting Islamists against those dirty leftists, communists, socialists. And that was the historical American policy, unfortunately. And so I think the, the advice that I would give 
is exactly as Mustafa said, this non-interventionism. I think even if we look at Afghanistan, the reality is, is that the history goes back all the way to kind of goading the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan. Uh, there is actually a, a history, uh, uh, historical evidence of that. Um, and so we are, bear, you know, these are the, the fruits that we bear if we, if we do this kind of thing. Um, the second point I would say is um, that when we talk about Western values and Muslims, I think what we're calling for is critical engagement with those ideas. It's not a blind aping or mimicking. And in that sense, we can take on the attitude of Ibn Rushd and other Islamic philosophers in history who said, we will take the good from it and whatever is wrong, we will correct, we'll thank them, but we'll correct. And so I think that's the correct attitude. And there's always been these kind of two strands in Islamic thought. One strand was anything that's outside of Muslims is haram and forbidden and, uh, and we will reject. And then the other attitude, which is the one that we are calling for is critical engagement, where you embrace what is good, correct what is wrong. And that's the attitude that we're calling for. And the last point on that is the people who say that everything outside of Islam is un-Islamic, they often don't acknowledge the influences that are outside of Islam that are, um, for example, this idea of compulsion and religion was taken from medieval Christendom. The idea of apostasy laws was from the neighboring empires that then were incorporated into the Islamic empire. So they just don't recognize those outside influences, whereas we are more critical and do acknowledge them. Very true. And on top of that, even some of what we consider Islamic law was just pre-Islamic Arab custom, right? I mean, uh, it was continued because it was convenient, but it doesn't, it doesn't give it as like a stamp of a universal Islamic truth. Rebecca, we have time for one last question. Okay, so I uh, there are some great questions coming in, and I, we do, really do appreciate all your thoughts on all of this. Uh, I'm going to just pick one of them that kind of crosses into two people's questions. Um, how can we make our leaders of the Muslim world and um, spiritual leaders in the U.S. recognize the problems of this and move towards some sort of a solution and work together towards a solution? Who wants to take that one? We, and you have one minute to answer that uh no pressure. Existential issue. Well, as the uh, since I wrote it, I guess I can just say uh, 30 seconds of, I think the only thing that we can do is put out our voice, put out our arguments, and these things snowball. And uh, But the one thing that's great that MPAC is doing is that it can't be individual thinkers. It has to be institutions and institutionalization. And I'd love to work further with Mustafa. So Mustafa, we're going to have to have you invite you to come to California um, to, to give a talk. And uh, we, we hope to work very closely with you. That's, that's but I'm going to let Mustafa it. actually uh, get the last word because he's our honored guest. Thank you so much sure. for uh, joining us. I mean, there is what I would call Islamic or Muslim populism, right? To always say we're the best and everybody's conspiring against us. We should just close the gates. And, you know, uh, I mean, that can also bring you a lot of, supporters and saying that because Muslims, we Muslims want to feel good about everything in our religious tradition. But sometimes you should take the hard pill and you should do the, you know, self-questioning. And that is only when actually societies make progress and civilizations go forward. And there are a lot of people engaged in that populism. Uh, you know, they, they may get a lot of brownie points here and there. Uh, just like there is a Western audience to cater, there is also a Muslim conservative audience to cater. And uh, I'm not denouncing any of these, but I think we need more independent Muslim intellectuals, scholars, and organizations like MPAC who will critically think on these issues, which, which doesn't mean we'll agree on everything, but we have to think on these issues because uh, the comp I mean, the, there's a gap that is being opened between the conscience of universal humanity. And, and some Islamic attitudes. I mean, if you say our religion punished apostasy was the death penalty, I mean, nobody really finds any value in that anymore. As, as I mean, Jawad said that thousand years ago, of course, I mean, Byzantines did the same thing. Nobody questioned that that should be the case. But and w despite the fact that we have so many great values to share, there are some impediments in front of those values that are established as law and you know the commandments and so on and so forth. That's why I think as response, Muslims who care about their religion, we should be able to th think about this. And this is not just a matter of the ulema, religious scholars, clergy, we respect them, but it's also any thinking Muslim who are about 
worried about the future of Islam. It's the future of our own, all of us, our own religion. So we all have a, have a right to say something about it. And the Quran says that it was made for people who think. That's, exactly. That is, I think, uh, an important lesson that both of you uh, articulated, uh, clarified, crystallized for us today. So I thank uh, Mustafa Aikil, and I reiterate what Javad said. We, we hope, uh, God willing, inshallah, to bring you to California uh, and continue this very important conversation in person. Uh, and we'll meet you also in Washington uh, sometime in the near future. So thank you both, Dr. Javad Hashmi, Mustafa Aikil, for your very important points uh, in outlining uh, how Islam stands for freedom. Uh, and when we say, la ilaha illallah, there's no God but the one God, that is our cry for freedom. We will not submit to any human being. Uh, and religious police is submission to human beings, not to the one uh, and only God. So thank you very much. Wonderfully put. Time. Thank and you, Salam, Jawad, Rebecca, for what you have done with this declaration. And inshallah, uh, more to do together. Inshallah. Well. And thank you, Salam, as well, for having the courage to put out this document because um, it's the first time that a Muslim organization has done that. So credit belongs to you for that. Um, and thank you, Rebecca, for facilitating. I'm going to close the broadcast. Thank you, everyone, for joining thank us. Thank you. All right. Thank so, you very much. Salam.